Welcome to 52 Weeks of Hope. This is where you get to hear how to feel happy, balanced, and worthwhile. How to make that lonely ache vanish and feel empowered, confident, and secure. I'm Lauren Abrams, and I get to help you feel that magic again since going through my own dark night of the soul by chatting with incredible leaders, healers, and elders who give us their message of hope after overcoming challenges of their own. Today, we get to talk to writer, producer, and funny man himself, Jack Hirguth. Jack's an entertainment executive who's written hit television series, he produces great shows, and he works behind the scenes a whole lot. But like all of us, Jack's so much more than his resume. He candidly discusses overcoming cancer twice, thinking his career was over after losing what he thought was his dream job. He also shares how he overcame his catastrophic thinking and what it and what inspired his new comedy podcast, Never Surrender, where he and actor comedian Stephen Kramer Glickman talk to people in the entertainment industry who have the rug pulled out from under them and think everything is over when really everything works out just fine. Go figure, huh? Enjoy this inside look at the entertainment industry and how to survive those tough moments. This poignant episode provides a lot of hope and solutions for you. And it's really for everyone who feels alone, empty, scared, or that they're never going to do what they're meant to do in this lifetime. This episode is definitely for you. We get to learn we're not alone and we've all been there. Welcome to 52 Weeks of Hope, Jack. Hey, Lauren, how are you? Thanks for having me on today. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, it's great to see you too. It's been good to to hear you talk about your podcast. And I actually am not positive what brought it about, but it's a great show. I've enjoyed listening to a few of your episodes. What? So first, what did bring about your Never Surrender? Because I, I know what brought my podcast about. It was from <laughs> my own dark time and me going out and asking people, okay, why are we here? What's the point? It was a soul searching. So what brought Never Surrender about? Well, I'd say it's a very similar thing that happened to me. I, gosh, so let me think. Uh, It was a couple of years ago. I think like it was around 2015 and I was working at a company and that I thought really was my dream job that I like, I was working at this company that I had wanted to work at. Um, I had grand designs of being there and and accomplishing great things. And uh, throughout the course of my year there, it was uh, absolutely miserable. (laughs) It was like the worst, like professional working experience I've ever had in my entire life. It was just like, I was being sabotaged by coworkers left and right. Just, just, just the worst horrible things. And at the end of that year, uh, I found out that I was being let go from the company just purely by accident. Like somebody in the, in the HR department sent an email to someone else in the HR department and accidentally CC'd me on the email saying that my last day was that day. And I just, they accidentally sent it to me, CC'd me on it. I saw it. So I got let go from there. It was just a horrible ending to a horrible tenure. Then about six months after that, my mom passed away. And then three, uh, two months, no, three months later after that, my dad passed away. Then another job I was working at, I got let go from that job. Uh, So it was two jobs in a year I got let go from. My parents died, both died within that year. And then a few months after all of that, I got cancer for the second time. And when all these things happen to you that are bad or negative or horrible or tragic, however you want to define it, you start thinking, you know, who have I made angry? Like, who have I pissed off? Like, you know, if you believe in God, did I piss off God? Did I make him angry? Like, what have I done? Why is the world just, you know, coming down upon my shoulders, like all the time without any sort of break? And like, nothing good was happening. Like, nothing good was happening. I was just in a really bad place. One day I was on my laptop and I was just messing around on YouTube. And I come across a video from Will Smith. And I think the heading was something about failure. So I was like, well, that's how I'm feeling right now, you know, through personal and professional struggles, I had just felt like a massive failure. So I click on this video and he's talking all about failure. And he says, it's important to fail often. It's important to fail big. Failure is a big part of being successful. I thought, first of all, what does Will Smith know about failure? What has he ever failed at? But the more I thought about it, it just stuck with me. And I started to think about, I wonder if you sat down with Will Smith, what his story was about failure. Like, 
what does he have to say about failure? And the more I thought about it was not just Will Smith, but what if you sat down with the most successful people in entertainment and heard about their stories of struggle, their stories of overcoming adversity, their failures, you know, why they never gave up and why they never surrendered. I thought that could be a really great idea for a show. That is something I would listen to based on all my failures, just learning from the failures of very successful people. And so I pitched it to my friend, Stephen, who's an actor, comedian, like you said, at the top of the show, and he's very successful, but he's also had his share of struggles like anybody else has. And he loved the idea. And then we pitched it to this company called Western Sound, and they've made a lot of very popular podcasts and they loved it. And then we started lining up, you know, celebrities to uh, interview. And so we sat down with comedians, actors, writers, directors. And the main thing that I learned from all of it was never give up. I mean, it seems like, like a very simple uh, piece of advice, but it's true. Like they all have the very same story. They've all struggled. They've all overcome adversity. But the main thing was they kept with it. They never gave up and they never surrendered. Did you interview Will Smith? No, I, we have not interviewed Will Smith yet. He is certainly one of the pie in the sky guests that we want to have. So hopefully someday. Yeah, you definitely will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and no, no doubt you will. Yeah, and, fingers uh, crossed. Yeah. It's interesting because the never give up is, yeah, that that's kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other is certainly. And do you get messages of how to never give up from your guests? How to get through a day? Because it's, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, don't give up. So, okay. So here it is. You hear this from Will Smith. Then what did you do? I mean, because things resonate when they resonate. We hear them when we, when we hear them. I'm sure you had heard that before. Don't give up. Keep going. But for some reason on this day, this resonated and you came up with the idea. How did you get through your dark period? I mean, that's a lot. You know, I would say, you know, and it sounds trite, but it's true. Like you just have to keep going. You just have to put one foot in front of the other and take things, you know, minute by minute hour by hour, day by day, week by week, and month by month, you know, because you will get through it. And when, you, when you're sitting there in that dark time thinking, I'm never going to get through this, and I've just had one horrible thing happen to me after another, whether it's losing a job, uh, having a loved one passing away from you, getting an illness, you know, and all that stuff happening, you just think, well, this is how my life is. Like my life is never going to get better. I'm never going to see the light of day. You know, the sun's never going to rise again. You know, it's that sort of thing. And it's very hard to get out of that mindset. Once bad things start happening, you, you start feeling like you are attracting kind of bad things, you know? And that's one thing, you know, me sort of being a little, having anxiety and being a little anxious, you start thinking like, am I attracting bad things? Am I bringing negative energy into myself? You know, you just have to wake up every day and try to have a positive outlook, no matter how hard it is. And some days it is very, very, very difficult to get out of bed and put a smile on your face and be like, the world's great. Even though I just lost my job and my parents are dead. And I had a horrible illness. You just have to project a positive attitude. And then hopefully that positive energy will start you know, coming your way. And I really feel like uh, at the beginning of this year, I, I just wrote, I, I tried to manifest some good, you know, some positivity. And I'm not one to really, to really do that. Like I always, I'm a little skeptical of things like that. You know, oh boy, here we are. We're, we're you know, we live in LA and there's all this mumbo jumbo. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah. about about people like, oh, I'm just going to manifest my my work and I'm going to manifest this and that. I'm always been very skeptical of it, but I was like, it can't hurt, right? Yeah. So, uh, on New Year's Day, on New Year's Eve, my wife and I and her kids just wrote stuff out that we wanted to happen in the new year, and I just wrote down all this positive stuff and put it into an envelope and put it away. Wait, wait, yeah. how did you get your kids to do it? Uh, we just said, let's, let's write. Well, we gave them a thousand dollars each. Okay, and okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we gave them lots of money and told them we would take them to Disneyland. No, I'm oh, kidding. Yeah. We just said, Hey, let's, let's, you know, write down on a piece of paper, all the good things we want to happen that we want to happen this year. And they were very open to it surprisingly because they're kids and they, they're never 
They never right. want to do anything right. that their parents want to do, right? right? Oh, do I have to do this? Oh, you're twisting my arm. Oh, I don't want to do that. But they said, okay. And which was a big surprise. Yeah. And <laughs> so I wrote down this stuff and I feel like, I don't know if it's because my point of view shifted or my attitude shifted at that point. But I feel like since the beginning of the year, it's been very, things have been very positive. And I feel like that's, this is the first time in a while, I feel like things are moving in a positive way. And so, you know, you could say life just moves in cycles, you know, and you've been through some bad stuff and now you're going to go through some good stuff, or maybe somehow I did manifest something. I really don't know. And I'm, I'm trying not to sit and think about it, but you know, I'm just happy that uh, I feel like I'm in a good space right now. And I'm happy that, you know, the podcast is out because this is something that uh, we've been working on for a while. And it's funny that the name of the show is never surrender because even the show itself, the production of that show had its problems. Uh, you know, we were signed up initially with a, uh, a podcast distribution company and they were going to give us like all this money to market the show. And we had a, a deal sort of in place with them. And then all of a sudden they just stopped returning emails and they stopped returning phone calls. And then my partner on the show had to leave and we didn't think he was coming back. And so it was very apropos to the show. It was just like one negative thing after the other. And I was like, okay, well, this show is never going to happen. It's never going to get made. There's just something in the universe that doesn't want this to happen. And again, that just kind of felt how everything was happening to me at that point. But uh, ultimately, my partner came back. We found a new partner and we recorded the shows and now they're out. I'm just happy that you know, people like yourself and people that I haven't spoken to in years or have heard from in years are coming out of the woodwork and calling me or emailing me or texting me and saying, hey, I'm listening to this show and it's great and I love it and it's funny and it's inspirational and it's just sort of what I need. You know, that makes me feel very happy because uh, it, it sort of came out of a dark place and my whole point of making it was, I want to help people who are in a similar place or are struggling personally or professionally and show them that, hey, you're not alone. Some of the biggest, most successful people that you would think have never struggled in their lives have had huge failures, have had huge struggles, have had massive setbacks, but they have overcome them. And hopefully that means that you will too. And yeah, so that's been my goal really with the podcast is just to sort of is to help people because I have been there. I know what those dark times are like. I know they're not fun. I know there are days where you feel like they're never going to end, but they will. You just have to hang in there. Yeah, it's I, I relate 100%. It is exactly how 52 Weeks of Hope was born. I mean, for me, at first, I was interviewing people for me. <laughs> like, why are we here? <laughs> what the hell was that? Yeah. And uh, I was just going around. I thought, all right, I'm going to interview a person a week for a year for me. Like, why are we here? It was an older demographic for sure, initially. And people would divulge such personal information to me. I, I, my whole thing was, they say nobody on their deathbed ever wished they worked harder, made more money. So you've lived a long time. What have you gleaned from life? Tell me. <laughs> people were divulging such personal information and telling me such good stuff. I was like, all right, this is so rich and so good. And there's getting to be such common themes. I would just go home and write it up, write it up to my best friend and stuff like that. And in my verbiage, and it was a lot of humor and just what I got from it, not for anyone else. And But there started being really common themes of community and what we need and different and that we do need each other and things like that. We can't sit around in a corner or in a closet by ourselves. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking. I'm talking to you from a closet right and now. So Jack recording in his closet. So we're <laughs> quiet. No kids, which I I so understand. I was wondering if all my dogs barking a few minutes ago, if I muted in time or not. But anyway, and so I was in some of my chapters that I end up writing. You know, I thought this is good. I have to share it or on the, my website. But I I had to pivot during COVID and start the podcast. And I love podcasting. Just love. So. And then when you were telling your story about the work, I was like, I'm an employment rights lawyer. So I was oh, okay. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, did you, did I get a call from you? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Anyway, I, 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 yeah. I should have called you. I know. I done. Great. But you yeah, it's like when you, when you are, you know, I've been in the entertainment business for a long time, you know, and I've worked 
uh, as a writer, I've worked as an executive, I've worked as a producer. And when you get to be in a business for 20 years, you know, you're like, you're, you know, you're older now. And then when things happen, where you start losing jobs one after the other, and you're sort of, you know, older, and it's like, you start to struggle a, a little bit about like, you know, where is my place? And where do I belong? And had all this success in the past? And why is why are all these struggles happening now? Like, isn't it supposed to be the reverse of things? Like, don't you struggle? And then you get your job in, in entertainment, no matter where you at, and then you, you get it. And, and then you work hard. And uh, that was always my belief, you know, and then you work hard and you make this is in money. your 20s. Yeah, that, this was supposed to happen in my late 20s or something. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. not now. And then 20s. you're like, why is this happening now? And so it was just a lot of, you know, again, thinking that I was a failure and, in, in, you know, having my pride wounded and feeling like, you know, I'm not a good dad or a husband or I'm not providing or, you know, those sorts of things. And, you know, that can really eat it, eat away at you, you know, at night when you're lying there in bed and you're thinking like, where is my you know next job coming from? And why did I have so much success? And why am I struggling now? And it can do a real number on you, you know, on your, on your psyche. And it can throw you into a big depression. Like I was depressed for a long period of time because I was just feeling like I, all, all of a sudden I was a stay at home dad. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not, you know, spending all that time in entertainment industry and working hard was not so I could just, you know, stay at home and wonder where my next job was coming from, you know? Yeah. But like I said, seeing that video with Will Smith that day really helped me out. And I was like, well, I've been in this place. I know there are other people in this place. And my goal really with this is to help people and get the message out that, you know, you will ultimately be okay. Yeah, I don't think there's any good thoughts late at night. I, I, that's just my opinion, but I just, don't <laughs> think, I just don't think there's any good thoughts. So you've interviewed a number of people at this point. Yes. Are there common themes that you're seeing in your industry? Because I've interviewed a lot of religious leaders and imam. I, I got that one wrong. A lot of rabbis, a lot of uh, all different spiritual leaders. The imam, I, I he corrected me. It, it's either imam or iman. One means uh-huh. faith and one means like it's the title, like a rabbi or a priest would have. <laughs> Got it. Me completely. Yeah. So have you seen common themes? You know, well, there's one thing and that is, you know, the entertainment industry itself is a very volatile industry, right? You know, things can change on a dime. And like you've seen over the past year with COVID, the movie business has, has made a complete 180, you know, and how movies are distributed, you know, that is clearly has had it made it has caused a major shift in how movies are consumed. Some of that is here to stay, you know, now a lot of people are going to be consuming movies from their homes rather than going out to movie theaters. As much as you want to go out to movie theaters, people are going to start watching them from home. So that's a major shift. You know, a lot of these uh, entertainment companies have now been bought up by tech companies. People are tech people are running them. So there's major shifts in that. So, my point with that is the entertainment industry is very volatile and everyone I've spoken to, like from Paul Feig, who directed Bridesmaids to Randall Park, who was just in WandaVision to Tig Notaro, who's, you know, a well-known She's comedian so and has been a lot so of shows good. from Star Trek to her own show, One Mississippi to this new Zack Snyder movie coming out. Like everybody has been fired at one point, had a personal issue or illness that they've had to overcome and people have had to uh you know at one point sort of buck up and swallow their pride like for example randall park was on a sh- when he was first starting out got cast on a show called wild and out on mtv which was a hugely popular show on mtv at the time he wasn't making enough money from the show because it was viacom and they don't pay very much and so during the day he had to get a job at Starbucks <laughs> uh, while the show was airing on MTV. And so, you know, he'd be working at Starbucks behind the counter and people would come in and say, and would recognize him and say, what, like, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> you're a millionaire. Like, you know, what are you, you know, why are you busting tables? Why are you making people coffee? And he said it was real uh, embarrassing because, you know, people will recognize him for TV. And not that working at Starbucks is embarrassing by any means, but when you have a high pro- profile job and people are thinking of you in one way, and then they come in and see you in another light, that was something he really struggled with. And he said, you know, one day 
I'm going to be a huge success and I'm going to come and go into Starbucks and I'm going to leave a huge tip, which he said he still hasn't yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that's one thing. And then, you know, Tig Notaro, her, her mom died, her girlfriend broke up with her and she got cancer all within like a matter of weeks. You know, that would be tough for anybody over a lifetime, but to happen in a matter of weeks to one person is, is, was very, very tough for her. And then Paul Feig uh, directed a movie that bombed and put him in what he refers to as movie jail in the sense that uh, he basically was, uh, nobody was calling him for work anymore. And he thought, well, you know, I love books and maybe I could get a job working like at Barnes and Noble and uh, just, you know, count down the clock to the end of my days working in a bookstore. There you love the catastrophic thinking. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's funny. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But it's <laughs> and so all of these people have faced tragedy. They face struggles at one point in their lives. And I understand to the normal working person. Oh, so you directed a movie and it bombed. Boo hoo. You know, that's like, you know, you know, first world problems. But it's still you know, he put a lot of time and energy into it. He spent, you know, years working on something and it was a huge failure. I think anybody who would work on something for a few years, no matter what it is, if it's a movie or a book or building a house or anything, uh, and it fails, that's a huge blow. And he thought he was never going to work again. And so that's scary. But what I have learned from most of these people, actually from all of these people is, Again, what I said at the top, and it does sound trite, and it's much easier said than done, and that is just keep going. You know, don't give up. You never know, you know, what's going to happen. You never know where your next job is going to come from, where, uh, you know, the next good thing is going to happen. So you just really have to keep moving. And that is something that I have learned the hard way myself, is that, you know, you have to wake up every day, put a smile on your face. And even if you're not in a good mood or you're having a bad day, you know, as, as Paul Feig said, actually, which I thought was really interesting, he sort of looked at life as, as an etch-a-sketch. And he said that if he was having a bad day, at the end of the day, all he needed to do was take the etch-a-sketch machine and just shake it up until it got erased and it was a blank slate. And then he would have a good night's sleep and start all over again the next day. And if at the end of that day, he was having another bad day, he would just shake up his etch-a-sketch and start the next day over the next day. And I think that's a very interesting and valuable way to look at things because if you are having a bad day, that doesn't mean you're going to have a bad day the next day or the day after that or the week after that or the month after that. You just have to try to be happy and realize that happiness is different from, you know, good days and bad days. You know, like there are days when things are going to go right. There's going to be days where things are, are, are going well for you, but you have to be, learn how to be happy between those peaks and valleys, you know? And that's something that I'm still learning. And that's something that Larry Wilmore, you know, said to me in one of our, one of our podcasts. And Larry uh, is a hugely successful TV writer and performer. He created the Bernie Mac show. He's won all sorts of awards. He had his own show. He hosted on comedy central called the nightly show. He just had a show in Peacock called Wilmore. And you know, he just said that you just have to realize that happiness is different than, you know, being, you know, I, I forget what he said, but I, you, you can cut this. What's yeah. that? And what you're doing for a living. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you might want to cut that out because I, I lost my train of thought, but it was, uh, you know, talking to Larry Wilmore, you know, he was very insightful. He got fired from the Bernie Mac show. Uh, and, you know, but he... Uh, went on to do other things. So, you know, he had a show on Peacock, he had a show on Comedy Central. So just because one thing ends doesn't mean it's going to end forever. There will be new beginnings. The Etch-A-Sketch was interesting. I was thinking, why not start your day over? If you're shaking, you, know, you can start <laughs> your day over at another time. Why wait till the next day if you're having a bad day? Just... Uh, anyway, it was just a thought. Yeah, uh, no, that's, that's, that's a very good point. Like, just because you're having a bad day doesn't mean you have to be in that, have a bad day the entire day. You can try to change it for sure. Yeah. 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 Try to change your attitude, which again, is much harder to do. Uh, easier said than done, but it's certainly, uh, you bring up a very good point. You don't have to wait until the next day. Yeah. It, 
It's just an idea. So why a podcast? <laughs> why a podcast? Yeah. Uh, because I thought it would be the simplest way to get the message out. And I thought it would just be a great way for people to hear these stories, you know, where you can just plug into your phone and, and listen to someone, you know, t- talk about their story. And yeah. I thought that was the easiest and most efficient way for people to, you know, hear these stories, the easiest way to get the word out. And what I have learned, uh, because I thought, oh, I'm going to do a podcast and I'm just going to get a microphone and start recording. And then the next day it'll be out. What I said earlier was that, you know, it was a lot more difficult and challenging than that because we had a production company involved and we had a distribution company involved. And then we had, you know, people drop out and, you know, people ghost us. And, you know, so it was like, it just became the sort of the theme of the show sort of personified was every day was a challenge to get this show made, which to me was just crazy because again, like I said, like, aren't we just supposed to be making a podcast like in a <laughs> <Right>. room <laughs> and we're going to record it and then we're going to get it out that day or the next day. Like what's so difficult about this? But for whatever reason, like everything else uh, at that, at, in that period was just a challenge. And, but again, that goes to show you that just because something is hard uh, doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. You know, now it's out. We had four episodes out right now. We have uh, Tig Notaro was our first episode, and then Randall Park, uh, Paul Fee, Larry Wilmore, and now JoJo, the singer, that just came out the other day. So we have five episodes out. And we did one season. We have like six more episodes to go. And, uh, you know, hopefully people will love it. You know, I'm getting great feedback now. And then uh, hopefully we'll get to do another season of it. Yeah, it's very fun. And I do think you help a lot of people. It doesn't matter what somebody's doing for a living. There's still a message to keep going, no matter what it is. Do you yeah. have a... Yeah, go ahead. I'm I was, was going to say, like, that's sort of another reason for the show is that, you know, I don't want people to think like, oh, just because you're in entertainment, this only applies to people who work in entertainment. For me, it applies to everybody, you know, no matter what you do, no matter if you're, uh, you know, if you work in healthcare if you work in construction, if you work in food service, if you do work in entertainment, if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're a podcaster, no no matter what you're doing, everybody at some point has struggled with something, you know? And I think that you can take what these very famous and very very successful people are saying and apply it to your own life. And you can look at someone like a Larry Wilmore or a Randall Park or any of these people and be like, wow, they really had a hard time and they were in a bad place and they thought they were never going to work again, or they thought they were going to die. And, but, but look, they all have made it out to the other side, you know, and that's not to say they won't face other struggles again, you know, odds are they will with something, but they have made it through. And for me, that's huge because at one point, I never thought I would make it through to the other side. You know, not that I was going to harm myself or anything like that. I just thought my life is over. It's never going to get better. And what these interviews have, what I have learned from these interviews and what they have taught me is that everything is temporary and that things will get better. You just have to get up every day and get through it. You know, as Paul Feig says in, the episode we recorded with him, he said his dad told him a story about Winston Churchill and Winston Churchill was giving a speech somewhere. And at the end of the speech, he just said, never, 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 never give up. And so that's really the mantra for the show is just don't give up. There are better times ahead and that, you know, nothing bad lasts forever. I was going to ask you for your message of hope, but I feel like that was it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that really is. That really is the message is, is that, uh, you know, just keep going and that things, you know, bad things won't last forever. And, you know, good things are just around the corner. You just have to have hope and faith that things will get better. And, you know, odds are they will. Do you have any kind of a morning routine that you do? Do you meditate? Do you exercise? Do you journal? Do you see a therapist? Do you have anything that you would recommend to somebody who to just to get through the day? I start off drinking. No, I'm, I'm kidding. That's not, 
What do I do? You know, I don't really have a routine. You know, I have, I don't really have a morning routine, but I have a lot of different things that are going on. I have my podcast. I have a show that I'm producing. I have a couple of shows that I'm producing. So my day is really filled with producing these, these projects. And so that sort of takes up all of my time, which is great because there have been times I'm just at home on the couch staring at the wall, (laughs) which is less fun. But, you know, I have had cancer twice. And one of the most valuable lessons I learned from that was I had testicular cancer. My first go around with cancer. My mother bought me Lance Armstrong's book because he had testicular cancer too. And he wrote it. One of the chapters was, you know, about the Tour de France. And, you know, you can say whatever you will about Lance and what happened with the Tour de France. But he said that during the race, if he ever felt like he couldn't keep going or he couldn't carry on or he wanted to quit, he would say to himself, you have had cancer. You have been through worse than this. And that would motivate him to keep going. That has, is something that I have never forgotten, that passage, because when I have bad days or even if I'm like in line at the grocery store and I'm getting impatient because the line's taking too long or I'm going to a meeting or taking my kids to school and there's traffic on the freeway and I'm sitting there I start getting impatient. And I just have to realize that, you know what? This really isn't that bad. You have been through so much worse and you need to put things into perspective. And so that's something I use as a reminder that I don't sort of go overboard or get too impatient. You know, I just try to put things into perspective, like, Hey, you've been through worse. This isn't that bad. And so that's something I always try to carry with me, you know, wherever I go, when things are bad, like, hey, you've been through worse, you got through it, this won't be, you know, a forever thing. That, that's so good. I interviewed somebody who's writing a book, The Seven Blessings of Cancer, and I think you just summed it up right there. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I, I'm actually writing a book, too, about my cancer experience. And it's something that I've, I've always wanted to write about and just have never had the time, nor nor could I, nor did I think I could ever write a book because it always just seems so daunting to me. And, but with COVID and everyone in lockdown and everyone being at home, I thought, well, now I have the time to actually do it. And so in the middle of that, and, you know, one thing I said in a speech that I gave, and it sounds so crazy and so weird, but to me, you know, Cancer was kind of a gift. And some people will say, how dare you say that, you know? But the way I look at it is I met so many people that sort of were, that came into my life that I never would have met otherwise that are special people to me, that are important people to me, that are now lifelong friends. And these people I never would have met ever in my life. And it has given me on a newfound appreciation for life. And also there are just some crazy, silly things that happen, you know, because of it. Like I became really great friends with my oncologist and just we became good friends. And, you know, one thing about, you know, getting a cancer diagnosis and, you know, being lucky enough to survive it is that you have to go to, con- to your doctor for continual checkups. The first year you've got to go like three, like, you know, every couple of months and the second year it's like, you know, less than that. And then the third year you're down to like every six months and then once a year. And then by the fifth year, if everything's still good, they kind of like let you go and they send you on your merry way. Basically you have graduated. And so I finally got to that point and my doctor says to me, you know, there's something I've really been waiting to talk to you about. And I wanted to wait until I knew that you were cured. But now that you are, I have an idea for a TV show. And I'm like, only in LA would yeah. your doctor pitch you a television show, right? And, Class. and, and uh, I was like, oh, okay, well, well, what's your idea? And he said, you know, nobody thinks cancer is funny, rightly so. Uh, but he goes, there are so many things that happen in this office that are funny, no one would ever believe me. I'm like, okay, like, well, what funny stories happen? So he starts telling me some stories. They were funny. And so I said, well, let me go off and let me think about it. He was like, okay. So 
<laughs> that was another thing that I just kept that, that thinking is, about. Just, just the fact that he waited, that he pitched yeah. it. Was, well, like I'm thinking, like, has that. he been waiting? Has he been waiting five years for this? Like, he must have been really patient. But at the, you know, so I'm thinking about it, I think about it, and I was like, you know what? I think, you know, this could be interesting. This could be a good show. And so uh, in the more I thought about it, it was like, you know, it could be a nice mixture of comedy and drama, you know? like a show like Barry or the time Louie, where you'd watch an episode and some episodes would be just straight dramatic and not funny. And other ones would be hilarious. And so that could be, you know, that sort of tone could fit with his show. And so I reached out to a friend of mine who is a very successful TV writer and he might writes mostly one hour dramas and he loved the idea and he wanted to bring in a, a friend of his who writes mostly half hours. So he could kind of put like a comedy and drama brain together and then we kind of sat together and came up with an idea for a pilot. And then they went off and they wrote a script. And then the agency that was representing us uh, read it and they loved it. And they said, well, you need like a big time comedy producer to help you sell this. And we're like, okay. So they sent it out to Will Ferrell and to Ben Stiller and all these people. And then one day we hear that Paul Feig, who you know directed Bridesmaids and Freaks and Geeks and was an executive producer on The Office, loved it. And like flipped out over it. And so we had a meeting with him and he said, I love the script and it's the best script I've read in a, a year. And I want to attach myself uh, as a director and executive producer. And we were like so excited. And so then we went out around town and we pitched it to like HBO and to Showtime and to Netflix and to Amazon and to TBS and to Comedy Central Everybody passed. <laughs> Everybody passed on it. And so, so that was discouraging. And again, I started feeling like a failure. One day, and not too long after that, we got a call from our agent saying, hey, Vimeo is trying to launch a streaming service like Netflix. And they want to compete with Netflix. Uh, they're going to launch in the spring. And they're buying projects from all these big time writers and actors and directors. And they read the script and they love it. And they want to meet with you guys. And we're like, okay, great. So we go in there. Uh, it's like me and the writers and Paul Feig and his producing partner and these executives at Vimeo. They start telling us how much they love the show. You know, they want to make it, they love it. And they basically buy it in the room. And if uh, you don't know anything about entertainment, that rarely happens. Rarely do people, there's a network or a buyer buy a project in the room. It's very rare. And so, we were, of course, very excited and, and very happy. Uh, then Vimeo said, well, we'll, uh, we'll send you an, uh, an offer letter and you know, get a deal together and we'll send it to you. And, you know. and then a couple of days go by, we don't hear anything. And then a week goes by, we don't hear anything. And then it's like two weeks, and we don't hear anything. And I call the ag our agents and they're like, well, we haven't heard anything yet, but you know, we should be getting something soon. And then three weeks go by and the company goes out of business. <laughs> So, you know, that to me is a, is a perfect example of, of, of never surrender. It, it's just that uh, there's good times, there's bad times, and you just have to, uh, you know, never give up, never surrender, and just, you know, make your way through them because uh, you never know what life's going to throw at you and, you. and you just have to really keep, you know, you have to keep moving. And that's, that's the main lesson I learned from everybody in these interviews is that you just really have to keep moving, keep going. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no telling what's going to happen. And I believe if, as long as you keep showing up, anything can happen at any time. Yeah, exactly. What's, what's, what's the famous saying? You know, you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yeah. Yeah. Know? That's so. risky. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> the famous philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this was so much fun talking to you today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for being a guest on 52 Weeks of Hope. Oh, thank you so much. And yes, please, uh, thank you. And for those listening, yeah, please check out our podcast, Never Surrender. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify and, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Yeah, we'll have links for everything up with the show notes on the website. So, okay, great. So we'll get all of that from you. And uh, yeah, this was great.
Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Be sure to tune in next week for the amazing motivational speaker and best-selling author, Amberly Lago. She saw her world crumble when an SUV plowed into her and she suffered horrific leg injuries. She was told to amputate her leg because she only had a 1% chance of ever walking again and saving it. She took that 1% and 34 surgeries later, she still has her leg. She is unbelievable and she discusses resilience, perseverance, and how we can overcome anything in life. She tells us what happens, but also what we're capable of. She gives her perspective on how, not ju- just how to live with chronic pain, but how to thrive and have this amazing life beyond our limited beliefs or limited thinking. So I just had an amazing conversation with her. You don't want to miss that next week. So be sure to tune into that. And I'm on Clubhouse on Tuesday afternoons. I'm also doing a motivation, gratitude, and manifestation room on Wednesday and Thursday mornings. I'd love to see you there. It'll also be live streamed to our Facebook group. Go ahead and join in and on YouTube if you're not on Clubhouse or on Facebook. So just if you don't know what I'm talking about, send me a message on the website, 52weeksofhope.com. All of Jack's links that he talked about will be available on the website, 52weeksofhope.com. Thank you so much for listening. If you're enjoying the podcast, please make sure to share it and tag me. I'd really appreciate it. And I'll give you a shout out on the show. Don't forget to tag me when you share it. Please follow the podcast and leave us a positive review and send us feedback on the website, 52weeksofhope.com. I'm Lauren Abrams. Thanks for listening.